Hello everybody, how are you doing? We're going to finish up Unit 7 today with the language podcast. So let's get started. Uh, language is defined as a system of signs and symbols used on, based on specific rules, such as grammar, and used to communicate. Um, it's a very complex human ability, uh, but is it a unique ability? Can other species use language? We'll talk about that. So, let's look into parts of language. Now, if you're going to create your own language, these are the things that you need. You need phonemes, which you all know, because um, I saw your examples in your vocab, uh, such as, phoneme is the smallest uh, part of sound. So, ch, uh, t, chat, right? So, you break down your words into the smallest part of sound that you need that's required to create that word. Now, morpheme is the smallest um, part of a language that has meaning. So the smallest word that has meaning. So morphine meaning. Let's not get those mixed up. Uh, meaning. Um, so the smallest word that could have meaning is, um, I don't know, A. A, right? A has meaning in our language. A signifies singular, right? One thing. Um, semantics. This is meaning in your language. So it's semantics to uh, understand that in the English, in the United States culture, um, apartment means, you know, a two, three room house that you live in, whereas in Britain, flat means the same thing. Um, and then syntax. These are rules that determine how words are combined in a language. So um, syntax suggests that, um, you know, if we have something plural, then we've got to make everything plural in the sentence. Or if we have something past tense, we've got to make everything past tense within the sentence. Um, so phonetics, how sounds are put together to form words. This is just um, how your language understands um, the way that things go together. Um, so like uh, C and H together is ch. It's not, you know, k. Um, but H with anything else would be silent. So, your grammar. This is the culmination of rules for generating your language. This includes the phonetics and the syntax of the language. Um, one of the most common grammar rules is that if you want to make something past tense, you put ed on the end of it. Pragmatics. These are social aspects of your language. Things to be polite. Calling me Miss Morley. Um, never calling me ma'am, right? I consider that to be rude, but most women are just fine with it. I just feel really old when you call me ma'am. Um, calling, um, you know, any of the male teachers, Mr. Um, and then conversational rules, right? Being polite about, you know, uh, the way that you say things. So in our culture, it's, it's more polite to be passive. Well, this is just my opinion, but... And then you say something that you think is controversial. Um, psycholinguistics, this is the study of psychological mechanisms related to language acquisition. So if language fascinates you, you can go into psychology and just study linguistics. There's a lot of fascinating conversations going on, like, does your language affect um, your experiences? So if you're not able to describe something, will you, will you never think of it? Um, lots of really cool questions. And uh, psycholinguistics also studies like standardized testing and how changing the language can affect whether or not someone is classified as special education or genius status. Um, so there's lots of different really neat questions in that field. Um, and Syracuse University has an amazing linguistics program uh, as well as a strong psychology department. So if you're interested in that, let me know. Okay, top-down processing versus bottom-up processing. So top-down is taking um, meaning and thought to create the production of sounds, and bottom-up is taking s the sounds to derive the meaning. Um, we're going to get into this in class. Alright, theories of language acquisition. How do we acquire nature? Or, excuse me, how do we acquire language? Is it something that we're born with, or is it something that's nurtured? Um, there are a lot of critical periods and stages of development for children, and that's something that we're going to focus on in our class time together. Um, but here are two theorists, Noam Chomsky and Skinner. B.F. Skinner, we know. He's that behaviorist we know and love. He focuses on operant conditioning, right? He's the rewards guy. Um, and he argues that if you model it, the child will learn. So the child says, um, I don't know, um, hit it, it, I guess. And you would say, yes, he hit, he hit it. He hit the bat. So you would correct the child's... Um, language and through the correction the child will learn. 
And then Noam Chomsky argues nature through his language acquisition device. This says that kids are born with the structure that provides grammar and vocabulary as they go into their environment. This is why we often have kids very early in their development, um, you know, saying certain words and putting certain things together, even though they've never been said together by anyone else around them. Like, no adult would ever say, hitted it to a child in order for them to learn it. So how did they think to put hit with ED? Anyway, um, so this is why Noam Chomsky believes that there's actually a nature argument here. Okay, and then finally I want to touch on linguistic determinism. This is by, this is the Sapir-Whorf hypothesis, and it argues that your language determines your thought. And one of their main case examples is the Hopi tribe, and uh, this tribe does, has no past tense in their language. And so they never think of the past, they never talk about the past, they never look at the past, they never reflect upon the past. So is their language determining their thought capabilities? This is the argument of linguistic determinism, that your language and its parameters as a mental set um, are prohibiting or encouraging your certain thoughts, your thoughts in certain areas, or once again, you know, limiting thoughts in certain areas. Um, Alright, language development. This is really vague. We're not going to get into it more in class, but Babies start with the cooing, the crewing phase, then the babbling. This is nonsensical syllables like goo goo ga ga. Then there's the hollow phrase in one word speech where they start. This is also called the naming stage where they start naming things like mama, dada. Then there's the two word speech where, two -word speech where we've got mama, milk, right? Mom, get me some milk. Uh, and then we have what we call telegraphic speech where they finally put, um, you know, uh, a cause with a you know a cause with an action uh, uh, or a noun with an action. So doggy bite face, right? So we're at like sort of a three word stage, and then after this we get verbs and modifiers added, um, like uh, you know past tense and uh, plurals and all sorts of things like that. And then syntax is acquired after this. Overgeneralization and overextension. Um, so they learn how to, you know, use their words to say things much bigger than what actually occurred. Um, so, and uh, they, this all happens within about the first year or two of life, and we're going to look more at, at this in class. All right, nonverbal language. So there, uh, typically language is thought of as something that is only verbal. Um, however, sign language is considered a language even though we don't have um, vocal inflection um, just simply because the vocal inflection is, is removed, right? We're not able to use our voices, that's why we have sign language. So there's a lot of nonverbal language that we have um, that doesn't involve any sound from us. Um, and this is not sign language, obviously. These are um, different expressions that we have, so see if you can uh, name the expressions that are going on here. Uh, and what's happening in each one of these scenes, and yes, I found this on the internet, and yes, it's totally weird. Um, all right, animal thought, last subject. So, do animals think? Um, scientists have found that yes, they do, and they studied mostly monkeys when they thought of this, and it says that animals are capable of more than what we originally thought they were capable of. They're capable of forming concepts, even pigeons are capable of doing this. And then they're also capable of having insight, so having that aha moment. Um, Kohler finds, discovers this. Tool use, we already discussed this in the first chapter, actually, when we talked about uh, natural observation. Um, and her, dis her observation of the monkeys just had made us redefine the definition of man because um, monkeys also use tools. Um, they problem solve as well. They will keep trying and trying and trying until they figure it out, so that's problem solving. Um, and they're also capable of basic arithmetic. Um, more complex mathematics it has not been um, possible yet, but arithmetic is there. Um, and then they are capable of transmission of cultural patterns. What that means is that they move out of primate stage when they work with humans, and um, not domestication, not domestication like cats, but they actually start learning mannerisms of human beings. Um, and they're capable of altruism and self-awareness. So, can animals talk? Well, they do communicate, but is it really a language? Um, yes, I would say it is. Primate language use, uses signs and symbols. Um, they have novel combinations of signs, 
that would indicate a higher level of cognitive processing. Their vocalizations have different meanings, so whenever we ask a question, we have an upward inflection, right? And, um, you know, whenever we shout something, it usually implies that we're angry, excited. Um, so uh, monkeys actually have this as well. They have gestured communication and they have facial expressions, which also indicate language and communication. Um, and here's three uh, really famous examples. Coco the gorilla, Washo the chimp, and Kanzi the bonobo. Washo is really interesting. Um, she learned to sign and her teacher adopted... Um, and and teach her adopted son to sign too. So she, she had an adopted son. She was able to express sadness when she was told that her adopted son had died. And after the infant died, she expressed happiness when she was given a surrogate baby to care for. So she's been really fascinating for science, scientists because she not only illustrates a capability to communicate in the English language um, through sign language, but uh, also to employ um, senses of motherness that we associate with human mother. That's all for now, guys. We will see you in class for a little bit more. We're going to get farther in depth with this, especially with developmental stages of language acquisition.